everybody. I, I hope you can hear me well. Otherwise, do let me know in the chat and I'll just shout a bit harder. Um, so we're pleased to see you at our session today where we will be talking about why history is essential to steer philanthropic approaches in today's world. And we'll do that through the lens of GGM's Ethics of Philanthropy report and John Ellerman Foundation's History Project. Um, we will delve into how understanding a foundation's origin can support grant makers' efforts to be more accountable, transparent, and inclusive. Um, the aim of our session is to talk about the work that is already happening on this topic, and we know it's an area that people want to know more about. So this is an opportunity to learn about an organization, John Ellerman Foundation, that is figuring it all out. And the, mes the message we would like to pass on today is that we invite and encourage you to try and really find ways to understand the origins of the wealth of your organizations or the organizations you're working for. And what can be done with that information, we will discuss that during this session today. Um, you are here with me um, and Roxanne, the two core organizing members of GGM, the Grant Givers Movement, and we are accompanied by Sufina, who is the director of the John Allerman Foundation. A bit more background on the two organizations. The Grant Givers Movement brings together individuals in, grant, in the grant giving sector to create collective power for positive change. It offers an opportunity for collaboration and challenging the status quo on important issues such as investments, power dynamics, systems change, and the role of philanthropy in addressing societal challenges. Our goal is to enhance and unite grant making efforts in and through the sector. John Allerman Foundation is an endowed grant maker who distributes five to six million a year um, nationally to advance the well being of people, nature, um, the natural world, and the society. And they do that by focusing on the arts, environment, and social action. The structure of today's session will be as follows. I'll shortly hand over to my colleague, uh, Roxanne, who will share the findings on the Ethics of Philanthropy report. Then Safina will give an overview of the history project at John Ellerman Foundation and its main findings. And then we'll have a short discussion uh, between us. And after that, we'll share the stage with you and take questions in. Um, I'm going to hand over to Roxanne now, and um, she'll be talking about the about GGM's Ethics and Philanthropy Report. Thanks, Anna. I'm glad to be representing GGM today with you and um, recapping the key findings from our report as a way of framing this conversation today. Some of you may have already read the report. It was published last year, but it's um, it, this question of um, the origin of wealth um, is one that is really unexplored, and so we wanted we want to keep finding opportunities actually to to raise this as a conversation within the sector. So this report, um, if you haven't seen it, captures the perceptions of 166 individuals who work within the grant giving sector, predominantly within the UK, in a wide range of roles in seniority. So. So that could be trustees, CEOs, grant managers, assistants, um, monitoring evaluation specialists, all kinds of different positions um, within the grant giving sector. Um, it also represents um, different types of funding entities as well. So private foundations, corporate foundations, community foundations, those are the public or local authorities, for example. There's a, there's a wide range of diversity as to the, the perceptions of those that are represented in the report. And there's also a really good balance between people who are new to the sector, so people who have only been giving grants for, for less than eight years um, versus those who've been in the sector for, for up to 20 years. So um, it's a really good balance of um, perceptions, as well as those who are based in fairly new funding entities versus those with much older histories of, of more than 150 years old, as well as those with, with large grant making budgets and those with smaller ones. The, the report interrogates the, the details of um, ethical philanthropy and grant making and looks at some, some of the key um, 
published pieces as well within the last few years that have sort of framed the conversation around this topic. It also seeks to explore two overarching questions. And the first one, which we'll be looking at more today, which is the question of ethics and philanthropy itself, linked to the origins of, of wealth. And secondly, it seeks to explore how ethics play out in the day-to-day -day in our grant making practice as well, and how grant makers can shift their practice to be more equitable um, and to respond to the calls for, for much needed reform. But before we start this conversation, it's important for us to just highlight what is meant by ethics in philanthropy within the report itself and how this links to what we're talking about today. Many of you will be familiar with the arguments set out in books such as Winners Take All and Decolonizing Wealth. Um, these authors and many others ask for or demand a much more democratic system um, all the way to towards a dramatic upending of current capitalist notions of what doing good actually looks like. Um, they argue that the current models that we have uh, shape and bend charities into their mold with very little thought of changing the existing system that perpetuates the inequity that enabled this wealth accumulation and the philanthropic giving in the first place. And this is important as many grant makers or, or philanthropic organizations talk about their strategy of advancing systemic change. But if you don't know where the source of your funding um, that you're distributing came from, how can you determine whether you're doing that, whether you're advancing that agenda or whether you're doing any harm? Um, as grant, my, as grant uh, makers, it, it can be argued that we have a responsibility to confront the reality that philanthropy originated from and that it, it may have contributed to the systemic inequities our um, very organisations are seeking to address. So on to some of the findings. Um, I don't have a huge number of, sort of data points you'll be happy to hear, so I won't bore you with those, but I'll, I will share some of the key messages through that um, research. And you're more than welcome um, to have a look and read the full report. And uh, I'll, I'll post that in, in the chat uh, shortly. But almost 80% of the respondents agreed or, or strongly agreed that where organisations were found to have benefited from wealth created through harmful or exploitative practices, that they should make reparations. We didn't go into what that would look like specifically, but there was a strong this, this statement really demonstrates a strong support for making reparations where philanthropic funds have come from unethical sources. The majority of the, of the respondents, though, couldn't even identify the ultimate origin of their organization's wealth, which was really interesting. In terms of their main source of income, almost 60% of the respondents stated that their organization is an endowed foundation. Many stated they engage in fundraising and others stated they receive an annual donation from an associated company or a living individual or family office um, or receive some kind of government or local authority funding as their main source of income among some other smaller sources. Although respondents could identify these sources as the, the, the first level back, as it were, in terms of trying to understand the source of where your funding comes from, they couldn't go beyond that. They couldn't uh, articulate or couldn't or, or, or um, didn't uh, share how the, for example, how the endowment was created in the first place. So where did that funding come from to enable the existence of that endowment? Um, when respondents identified that the source of their income was a donation from a wealthy individual, Again, they did not or, or could not specify how the individual's wealth was actually accumulated. Similarly, where the income was profits from a business or investment, detail wasn't provided on how this business or investment activity made these profits in the first place. Um, however, a few could identify this uh, and where they did uh, identify the origin of the organization's wealth Examples included things like the fur trade, slave trade, profits from the British Empire, and the extractive industry. Um, so some of the conclusions of the findings was uh, for us acknowledging really that you know, there's very little is known about 
um, the origins of an organization's world. Um, and there's very few organizations that are actually thinking about this in terms of um, how they understand their organization's identity and how this might relate to the work that they're currently doing. And this may signify a need to increase organizational transparency regarding the origins of uh, philanthropic wealth, um, to engage in conversations like we're doing here today with organizations on understanding the origins of their wealth, why it's important and how their history may be reflected and how and to whom they grant their funding to the present day. Um, so it's really interesting to see that the starting point is quite low in terms of numbers of organizations or, or individuals within those organizations understanding their history and the, the origin of that wealth and very few examples being provided of those who are actually looking into this and doing something about the findings that that, um, that, that, that come out of that research itself. Um, the John Elliman is, is one example of that, and I will pass back to, to Swella so that we can hear more, more about that um, in the next part of the discussion. Thank you, Roxanne. There is there is food for thought there and lots to unpick. Um, thank you. Um, we'll, I'll hand over to Safina now, who will tell us about uh, what John Ellerman Foundation has been doing around this, um, their approach and an outline of their key findings with the history project. Over to Great. Safina. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you, Suela and Roxanne, for your kind of reflections. They're really helpful, nice kind of grounding for this space. Um, so I'm invited here to talk a little bit about what we've been doing at John Melliman Foundation. Um, so we have very imaginatively titled our work into our history, The History Project. And so that is what I'll be talking to you all about. Um, and it began, it predates me quite considerably. So I joined John Elliman Foundation in January 2020, but our work on our history or our history project started in 2012. And it started very much in response to the fact that we're quite unusual as a foundation in that we were set up in 1971, but we have very few living links to our founder, John Elliman II, Sir John Elliman II. And so in 2012, the trustees recognized that our last kind of connections on the board to our founder were coming to an end. Um, our founder didn't have any children, but he did have friends and business associates who stayed linked with the foundation. Um, and the last link kind of went off our board in 2012. So that then prompted this reflection on should we be doing something to um, put into writing to kind of seal in a way that we hadn't previously some um, reflections on who we were and how we were founded. Um, and the way that that started was through an oral history project. So a decision was taken by the board to reach out to people that had known our founder and his wife or members of his family who were still alive and to interview them essentially to find out what they could remember about him. And that was kind of the start of it all. So quite a kind of benign and gentle entry into researching our history. And I think that probably worked well for us um, and was probably quite typical of what lots of other foundations and funders were doing and have been doing in this space. Um, and I think that there was a relevance to considering um, a, an oral history project because we were also in a slightly unusual position that although our founder had set us up in 1971, he had then unexpectedly died two years later. So we never really got into the kind of day-to-day -day operations and delivery of our foundation. And so we didn't really have a sense of why he'd set us up. And so the hope had been that the oral history project might have been a way into that. So that's kind of 2012. So oral history kind of interviews are kind of taking place, not in any kind of urgent, systematic, deadline oriented way, to be honest with you. Um, and we were just kind of undertaking interviews, a cluster every year or two, and they were getting written up. And there was no real sense of clear purpose behind what these um, interviews would elicit and lead to. In 2018 and 19, 
there was a deeper reflection around whether we needed to maybe become a bit more structured about what we were doing around our history rather than this kind of side project add-on that seemed to just burble along in the background. And it was a good lesson, the kind of reflections in 1819 around how I think with this type of work, you need to um, walk rather than run sometimes. And so um, they reached out, the uh, former team reached out to an individual who we knew had done some research into our founder's father, Sir John Elliman I. And we said to him, would you go and do some research into our history? We'd like to get you to write up everything you can find about our founder, his father and his sister in particular. Um, and it ended up being quite a difficult project to manage. And so um, nothing really came of it. The researcher was kind of working on this alongside lots of other priorities that he had. He was in a different time zone and he um, had a very different perspective on what research was available and what the research direction should be. Um, and so the um, foundation parted ways with him um, after a couple of months. Then in 2020, when I arrived, um, I commissioned a small piece of work, which was to um, ask a researcher to do a desk-based review of what she felt was available within different archives across the UK. Um, so we had some inklings that there was archival material about our foundation, or more specifically, I should say, about our founder, his father and his sister across multiple archives in the UK. And we asked her to basically determine whether our um, suspicions on this were correct. And so she did a full review of um, archival material in the UK and discern from that where she felt material existed. And from that, for the first time ever, we got this um, realization that we'd been operating on this kind of theory, this hypothesis that no material really existed. We knew that our founder was intensely private. He was very publicity shy. Um, and we also knew that a lot of his kind of, um, uh, you know, personal effects no longer existed. So our view was that there was nothing that could really trace, uh, that we would be able to find that talked to our history. This researcher's view that we commissioned gave us quite an extensive list of different archival material and our views changed. So um, in March, we got that report in 2020 um, and we essentially shelved it because then lockdowns happened and we knew we couldn't get into the archives and um, we had different priorities and different things that we had to focus on. Um, so then 2021, it was our 50th anniversary and we once again felt all too keenly this total lack of real knowledge and expertise about our own history. And so we decided we would put out a public uh, request for proposals um, and seek information in a very kind of systematic, clear, well-defined and purposeful way around um, the philanthropic business and personal histories of three key individuals. So we were founded by Sir John Elliman II, but we were interested in learning more about his father, Sir John Elliman I, and his sister, um, Annie Winifred Elliman, who's also called Briar. The reason we focused on these individuals is because our founder's money primarily came from his father. Um, and we also know that his sister was a much more public figure than he ever was. And so we felt that there might be some good kind of ways of learning more about him through investigating her in more detail. Um, and so we wanted to cast the net quite wide in order to capture as much information as we possibly could about our um, foundation's history. So that piece of work um, was commissioned in November 2021. And in the last 18 months, the work has been happening in earnest. So we commissioned a team of three researchers, um, all of whom had been um, studied and trained at the University of Cambridge. Um, and so the three of them alongside a project advisory group that we set up um, and 
uh, you know, ongoing input and expertise from our board and staff team resulted in what is an almost finalized publication that we'll be putting on our website later this month. And because we love um, snappy titles or really good at naming things, um, we called it John Elliman Foundation, a historical overview. Um, and so what this uh, publication splits into is four different chapters. Uh, one chapter concentrating on our founder's father, another chapter concentrating on our founder's sister, a third chapter concentrating on our founder, and then a fourth and final chapter that concentrates on the foundation itself, what we have done in these last kind of 50 to 51 years that we have been in existence for. And in kind of embarking on this project, there's kind of two main reflections that we keep coming back to that we are sharing and will be sharing later this month and, and it will stay on our website going forward. So the first is that, I mean, we've made multiple considerations, but I think there are two that I, I want us to highlight here and that we'll be highlighting going forward in the kind of um, publications and communications we do around this piece of work. So the first is that we know our founder was intensely private he would have disliked the publication that we are about to share publicly on our website. We have chosen to make it a public facing historical account because it is our belief that there is a legitimate interest from those working within the foundation um, and those working with us both previously and present day and in the future. Um, there is a legitimate interest in understanding where our wealth comes from and we're really keen to um, model accountability and transparency around what it is that we found so that's the first thing we're totally cognizant of the fact that our founder would not have liked a public facing document to exist about who we are and where we have come from the second is this idea that applying kind of present day ethical standards to practices and individuals from the past is not straightforward. Um, for us, the research has given us the fullest ever written account about the foundation and about the character acumen and ambitions of our founder, his father and his sister. We found much that we can, you know, Lord in terms of the their philanthropic endeavors, although I think you can caveat some of that um, with the motivations and the methodologies that they adopted, although I don't think they were too dissimilar um, to the motivations and the methodologies you would expect from philanthropic endeavors carried out in the last century. Um, and I think we're being very open about the fact that I think you know, the motivations for even being set up as a foundation in the first place are complex. Um, a primary concern was to guard against the effects of a state duty for um, and his heir, which in the case of our founder was his wife, he didn't have any children. And so, um, and another reason was that his funds and his um, wealth was tied up to Elliman Lines primarily, which was a shipping company, and he was keen to make sure that um, estate duty wasn't applied in a way that meant that the company and the workers within it wouldn't end up being kind of broken up and, and at risk of losing their jobs for the workers. Um, so when the trusts were originally set up, um, there was no obligation written in from our founder to prioritize grant making. Um, and the priority was very much about the ongoing kind of ability for the companies to exist. Um, and so it took some years before a kind of charitable disbursement through grant making even ever happened um, after we were set up and after our founder unexpectedly died two years after he, he first set up the trust model. The other thing that our research has shown is that the um, the businesses from which our wealth was derived, and in brief, that comprises shipping, brewery, um, breweries, coal and oil, property, and newspaper and publication interests 
were absolutely involved in activities that their modern equivalents would reject, and so do we. Um, and so we have seen and uncovered evidence of things that um, we are absolutely acknowledge as being unacceptable in the present day. Um, and so to that end, we are being completely open about those findings, and you can see it in the kind of comms that we planned around the um, publication as well as in the publication itself. So, you know, the chair of the foundation and I have written uh, a preface for the document outlining and summarizing what those issues were. And so there, there are things that we've uncovered in relation to um, some of the apartheid systems that were in place in South Africa and Nab Namibia, um, and also the fact that our founder's father um, and was someone who was um, very supportive of the British Empire and the fact that we, um, you know, Element Lines could exist as a very thriving and effective and money-making endeavour in terms of shipping um, is due to the fact that there is a colonial leg legacy that exists within the UK. Um, so for us, this exercise has been about First of all, just learning more about who we are and what that means in practice, because we have a true and deep belief in the fact that you have to understand your past in order to um, understand your present and plan for your future. Um, it's important to recognise what it has happened in your past and how that may continue to prevail or exist in different ways in your present and how you can then manage those going forward. Um, and and the other reason that we wanted to do this who we are that that is the kind of main thrust of it and then from that we've been able to review these findings and determine what are we doing already that addresses these um, findings and it also then acts as a tool through which we can continue to think through what we could be doing next in order to address the findings um, and throughout, we've had an agreement and support for the fact that we must share this as publicly as we can do. Um, and that's why we're sharing it on our website in the coming weeks. And that's why we talk about it publicly in events like this. And it's why we're also uh, looking to do transfers of our archival material to um, the philanthropy archives, which is based at the University of Kent. Um, and yeah, so I'll leave it there. But just to say that I think you know, for those undertaking uh, reviews of their history, this is not something that just happens overnight. I've just, you know, outlined um, in summary form a, a, what is essentially a 10 year journey that the foundation has been on to do with its history. I do think our journey has been made slightly more complicated and slower by the fact that we have um, no links to our founder. Our founder un unexpectedly died two years after setting us up. Um, and you know, it's the peril sometimes of being a smaller organisation um, that mean that, you know, it's always a priority alongside lots of other priorities. But I do think that we have made um, good, positive progress in the last two, three years, which we're very pleased about and are looking forward to sharing more and discussing further. Thank you so much, Safina. Um, that's really informative. And it sounds like work that must have required a lot of ambition, commitment, and courage. So well done in undertaking this work. Um, we'll have 15 minutes to have a discussion among us, and then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes to take your questions. The second part where you'll be take well, where we'll we will be taking your questions won't be recorded. So it is very much a safe space for you to ask anything and everything that comes to mind in order to help you understand the or origins of your organization's wealth. But just to um, to come back what Sufina has told us today, I'm just really curious to hear what have been the greatest challenges and um, your biggest wins uh, for you throughout this journey. Um, yeah, thank you, Suela. I think one of the biggest challenges is, you know, um, I'm not a historian. <laughs> I don't have a background or an expertise in conducting reviews of one's history. And um, I think that's the case 
quite generally within the sector. And so um, I think there's something about being quite clear about what you don't know and trying to figure out how to resolve that. And so in terms of biggest challenge, um, I think it's about making sure you're taking um, advice and, and taking insights from people who really are much clearer on what it is that you're trying to achieve and can guide you um, accordingly. Um, I, I think that some of the work that we tried in 1819 was perhaps um, hampered or hindered by the fact that we lacked that expertise. And I do think that with things like this, it is about trying to break it down into smaller chunks because you know what we've ended up with is essentially a book that speaks to our history and if I'd realized that at the beginning I probably would have um not wanted to do it because it would have felt overwhelming and way outside of my um expertise and experience and I think breaking it down into different chunks getting the right people around you you know always makes it a lot easier and in terms of achievements I think the fact that we've been able to keep this work going under the circumstances of the pandemic, um, where we haven't had access to archives in the way that we would have always liked, um, that we've been able to conduct it in a way that we call, put out an open call for proposals, we've been able to um, share openly the process that we've been undertaking, um, our board has remained really committed and dedicated to this um, point around transparency, and we've absolutely found things that are deeply uncomfortable and wrong, and yet we haven't kind of shied away or changed tack in terms of making sure that this remains an outward facing endeavour. Um, so yeah, I'd say that's a, been a, a key achievement. Really impressive. Thank you so much. And on the achievement, hopefully it is a lesson or an inspiration to other funders as well to do exactly that. Um, so with the topic of today's session in mind, my next question is, how does the foundation ensure that its grant making decisions reflect an awareness of the historical context and potential ethical implications associated with, with that origin of wealth? You already touched on, on you know, applying present day ethical statements um, to um to to the to the past is not necessarily practical or feasible but what would you say um could be done so i think the first thing to say is we really didn't know much if anything about our founder we have uh, i think kirsten has just put something into the chat which takes you to our story mm -hmm. and essentially what's on that page is what we can unequivocally say we we knew um, what we have now is, is a book, <laughs> basically, mm. we know a lot more. And one of the good things about this um, project is that we know for sure that um, these kind of things we thought about our founder being intensely private are kind of corroborated by, you know, primary and secondary um, sources of evidence. We know that our founder would probably be very supportive of the work that we fund under arts and environment. And we know that he would be deeply uncomfortable with the work that we fund under social action. Mm. I think he would have preferred our previous category of welfare and social action, which supports policy advocacy and campaigning is probably work that he wouldn't be super happy about. And yet we can show why we've moved into those spaces. That is part of our kind of strategic evolution and direction of travel. So I think it's nice to see those moments of kind of connection and it's good to know that where there are moments of distance um, as long as we're clear on why we're doing it and we know you can hold the two as truths if you like so that's one thing the other thing is when uncovering the kind of issues that we've identified in terms of you know business practices back then that would be and are unacceptable in the present day first of all we're not naive enough to think that what we do now is going to be acceptable in the future either, um, particularly around the way in which we manage our investment. It's primarily invested in, um, in ESG funds or funds that take into account environment, social and governance factors. That is considered good right now, but is it good enough? And so that's why we're always wondering about what we do in the present day, how it could be enhanced and better. Uh, because we recognize that in the future, people may look back on what we are doing and think that wasn't good enough. Um, and then in terms of the things that we have uncovered, 
that we realize are not good enough. Um, I think it's for us about looking at what do we do? What kind of work do we fund? Um, and so I think we fund work that addresses um, quite um, effectively the kind of societal and environmental harms that our funding was, um, in, uh, sorry, our wealth was derived from. Um, but equally, we're at the beginning of this, we now have the most comprehensive analysis of where our wealth has come from. And so this is now a tool that we can use to consider how we um, carry on operating going forward. And so we've got a sense of what our baseline is, what we're doing already, and if and how that addresses what we have learned about our um, past and the origins of our wealth. But it also allows us to think beyond that and go and carry on going with what we could be doing more of and also what we might need to do less of. Mm. That's thank you, Safina. I have quite some follow up questions, but I'm not going to take too much of everybody's time, as I'm sure everybody else has a lot of questions as well. I'm going to, uh, to yeah, I'm going to ask you my next question, um, actually to the both of you, um, if you could give one piece of advice to funders to ensure the transparency about the origins of their philanthropic wealth, what would it be? Would you like to start Roxanne because maybe yeah. Sofina can have a two minute break? Sure, absolutely. And I'll, I'll be brief so we have a bit more time for questions. Um, not having done this research directly myself, um, I'll just pull on some thoughts that came out from, from the research. Um, our research findings highlighted how those working within the grant giving sector continue to feel most accountable to trustees, followed by senior management rather than the communities that they're seeking to serve. And, and this came out in research in previous years as well. And this seems to be a continuous pattern that we're seeing that there's recognition of, of the power that trustees hold within grant making organizations. So I, I think a piece of advice I would have is that you really need to encourage trustees to support and be part of initiating the, the type of research into the origins of wealth of the organization they're accountable for. I, I don't think it should be a piece of research conducted by a, a single individual or a small group of colleagues within your foundation. I think it needs to be an organizational wide project as Safina has described, for, for everyone to be part of that journey and to build that um, story together and to then be in a better position to be able to use the findings of that in practical ways. Um, and I think if you're if you're joining us today as, a, an, as an individual grant maker, perhaps you haven't embarked or, or thought about this um, before, I think a really good starting point is to just ask questions when you go to work. Um, tomorrow and, and see whether others around you know the origin of your organization's wealth and to, to just start conversations about it. Um, just I, I would really echo what Roxanne's already shared and just very briefly add that um, I think that really understanding why you're doing this is important. Having a kind of clear sense of shared purpose and intention behind it keeps you motivated especially when it starts to get a bit complicated or feel a bit outside of your kind of knowledge zone. Um, so I think having a clear sense of the motivation and why you're doing this and on the kind of transparency point, I think that um, at the very, very, very least, um, I think transparency should be built into the way you conduct this kind of work within your own organization, both at a trustee and a operational level. And um, I think the more open you can be about the findings and what you're learning internally gives you the kind of um, foundations from which you can then do so externally too. Um, and I would always encourage people to, to um, aim for being transparent externally too. Excellent. Thank you both. And um, I've got two more questions and one of them, I'm sure I'm not the only one. Those are very good, good tips and takeaways um, for funders, but also individuals in the sector. But um, 
the first thing that comes to mind if I leave this session is how do I even start to find this information? Where can I look to get the to get the information? Because uh, often it can happen that it's happening in 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 a hidden or secret file that nobody knows about internally. And if I do want to know more about it, how do I start conversations or ask questions without ending up upsetting anybody within the organization? And feel free, you're both to answer the question. Um, I would just say that um, in terms of starting the information and finding it out, I think sometimes organizations do have living links to um, their origins. And so it's it's almost like a mapping exercise. Like, what do you already know? Um, who do you already know that might have some answers? Um, and then in terms of methodologies, there's different things. You may have your own archives and um, how are they kind of managed and uh, catalogued, how much of the information within your own archives is actually understood. Uh, you, you might want to do things like your history project, I think. Um, and again, it comes back to purpose. Why are you doing it? Do you want to understand the character of your founders, in which case oral history is a really good way in which you can learn more about the character of your founders. If you're looking for the origins of your wealth, then you will have to do a kind of um, deeper dive into things like primary and secondary sources of material. They could be in archives that you hold or archives held elsewhere. Your founder might be, uh, founders might be public figures. And so I think it's something about again understanding the purpose and the intention behind what you're doing kind of elicits the methodology and where you can find that information and I'd always start close to home and then just kind of build out from there and how to start having the conversations I think it is about asking people in the organization if this is something that's been discussed because you know as much as this process started for us in 2012 it's not like we've been working on it every single day since then. And so even if it, you know, you might join an organization and it feels like nothing's happened or happening about it, but you may find from some conversations that there have been little pieces of work that have happened. And so it's good just to kind of anchor yourself and, and kind of test any assumptions that you might have. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think it's worth remembering sometimes the origins of your own organization may be interlinked to another organization, in which case they may have done research into your history, which mm -hmm. might, you know, motivate people to do your own research or take some of the kind of complexity away. And I just think that, you know, it's also about how you intend the questions that you make. If it is just out of curiosity and mm -hmm. interest and mm -hmm. seeing a value add, then it doesn't have to be this kind of contentious, challenging mm. thing. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot of positivity, um, lots of positives that can be gained from undertaking research into your history. And I think it's about trying to frame it in those ways. Mm. That's very useful because it can be tricky information and um, very uncomfortable truth that could be emerging from, from that history. So, um, yeah, your your answers really do add a little bit more balance in how to frame it and how to how to just be curious about it without without um, upsetting others, I guess. Um, yeah, Roxanne, did you want to come in there or are you? Yeah, sure, just yeah. very briefly, and perhaps I'll answer it from that perspective um, where you are finding yourself in an organization where you feel it may be a contentious subject, but like I, I, and I think every organization is going to be very different, so you just really need to read the organization, really, and, mm -hmm. and understand, um, sort of work out who your cheerleaders might be internally in all areas of the organization, and engage with them as a first step. In, you know, be be curious, ask the questions with them, and um, just don't don't do this alone. Um, I would recommend mapping potential barriers and motivations to help inform your approach and, and bring people together to talk about this more. Um, research and history and potentially unearthing difficult information can be seen by committees or trustees as sort of political type work. Um, trustees need to be engaged from the start if you feel that this could be the, the, the response. Perhaps organize a conversation within your organization with, you know, in collaboration with interested members of leadership. You could also come at it from a risk perspective, you know, articulate the risks of not doing such research or, or perhaps start with current practice. 
you know, the, the, the lack of transparency is not limited to historical donations. Um, for example, those engaging in fundraising, our research found that most organisations do not have a policy on when they will or will not accept funds from donors. Um, so this could suggest that organisations may continue intentionally or otherwise to raise funds from potentially unethical sources. Um, exploring the usefulness of creating an ethical policy as a first step might be an interesting way to create a conversation about the present day that may lead you on to a historical conversation. Um, you can also link up with efforts led by others too externally. So there's a growing movement that's been encouraging foundations to rethink how their wealth is invested and the consequences of those investments. You could seek to connect um, with those organisations um, and just to illustrate how important it is to look at your organisation, look at how your organisation is investing its wealth. The top 300 UK foundations alone have an annual collective assets of more than 72 billion. A large proportion, which is invested in financial schemes, shares, property, commercial ventures, yeah. with the expectation of achieving a profit. Um, and if investment portfolios are not carefully and responsibly managed, they can end up cancelling out or worse, perpetuating the inequities that, that you're seeking to improve with the funding. So it's not just about the history. You can, if, if the history is where you want to get, but you could use the present day as your starting point and work your way backwards. Um, so that's that's um, just my two cents on that. That's really useful. Thanks, Roxanne. And good takeaways there, particularly finding cheerleaders or even safe spaces and allies to discuss these things. And, and not just looking at the past, but the present can say a lot as well. So that's those are really good points there. Before I open up the stage, my very last question is, well, you've got that information. So what what would be the three things you would you would uh share with us um and yeah three things we can walk away with today i'll hand over to safina um i do think sharing it in the first place is important so publish it um have a clear kind of sense of what your response to it is and make that um clear uh talk about it whether that's three four like this or through one-to-one -one conversations and I know I have um, somewhat regular conversations with other trusts and foundations and funders who are considering this kind of work and then use it use it to think about who you are now and what this um, tells you and what you might want to do going forward as a result of it so you know it's not just a kind of tick box exercise it should be a kind of piece of work that in many ways is live um, and, and keeps informing what you do in the present and the future. Excellent. Just, Thank you. Yeah. I would Go just on. add one, one thing. So I completely agree with, with uh, Sabina's um, suggestions. I think the only other thing I would add is to, to think about the impact of the findings on your staff throughout the journey um, and their well-being, particularly staff who are already bear the brunt of systemic injustice that you may have on your on your on your team, mm. and create a safe space for staff to engage in findings mm. and and participate in a meaningful way in developing the next steps for those findings. Um, as has been said, your organisation will need to answer the questions of who do you stand with, um, who are who are you here for. Um, there may be deep organisational, strategic, cultural changes that require work. Your organisation may find itself needing to reshape its identity and purpose. Mm -hmm. And so it's it, it's you know it's a really interesting piece of research that could really reshape what your organisation does. Um, and it may sort of unearth many questions from multiple staff members. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Roxanne. Um, I'm going to open open up the stage or share the stage uh, to receive any questions. You can pop them in the chat, unmute yourself, 